It is great to be back here with you all. It's been quite a while, and it's actually kind of funny. I say y'all. says I lived in South Carolina long enough that I picked up some southern things. I was in western Pennsylvania last weekend, and uh, they said, you said y'all, but you said you're from West Virginia. And I said, yeah, you pick up different things. So I picked up a good from the south saying y'all all the time. And so that's part of what I, what I do. But it is good to be here. Uh, it's been quite a long time since we were with y'all. Uh, it was, I was looking back, now every time I say that, you're going to be laughing at me, but uh, I should have, shouldn't have pointed that out, but uh, I was looking back, I think it was in January of 2012 that we were here with you all for the last time, so it's been almost nine years, and of course during that time we were raising our support to go to Brazil, and we didn't have a chance to, to get back and see Y'all, so a lot of things have changed. It's good to see the coffees. It's been a long time. We're thankful for them and, and their faithful ministry, their, their faithful example. And uh, I laughed out loud when I saw that Mark was the new pastor because, oh man, this is going to be fun. Uh, his dad's church actually supports us as well. And so uh, in, in Michigan, and so I thought that's kind of funny to have a, a, a dad and a son um, each supporting us as individual supporters. Uh, but we have a lot of good memories. Uh, we were in missions classes together. So um, I seem to remember that Mark would always wake me up. I was working a lot, and uh, I, would, <laughs> I would get up really early. I was a morning cook, and I seem to remember Mark would position himself behind me and kick my chair to try to keep me awake in some of the classes. So uh, he, was a, he was a good friend in that way. So that's all I'll say about that. But we did have a lot of good times uh, on the Northern Lights and in the same classes and missions. I'm thankful for his heart. And I'm excited to see how God will use his ministry here and his heart for people. And at the end of the day, that's what ministry is all about. It's about interacting with people, sharing the good news of Christ, helping us to, to experience God's grace and live it out in our lives. And uh, so very thankful for this church, for Mark, for Pastor Coffey, for all of you that are here this morning and for your faithful support for us uh, over many years. Uh, we are here in the States. Uh, we arrived shortly before Thanksgiving. Uh, of this past year, and we are headed back on November 11th. We have our tickets, so you all are the very last church that we're reporting to. We'll be at our home church the next two Sundays before we leave. Uh, our home church is in Greenville, South Carolina, so uh, you're the, the very last one, so I should be very polished and, and prepared. No, just kidding. Um, with regard to, to, to our update, uh, there, there's a lot of neat things going on in Brazil. We're thankful for what God has done over the First term that we had in Brazil, we were there for four and a half years. God just opened a lot of neat opportunities for us to learn the language, to, to be part of numerous ministries, more than I possibly expected. In fact, we found that there were so many opportunities. We were kind of overburdened with, with the opportunities. We're thankful to work with established churches, but also in a place where there's lots of need for new church plants. Um, during our first term, God opened the door for us to even uh, start planning our own church in the city of Kajazetis, and that's where we'll be returning to um, when we go back to continue that work there. God opened the door for me to go to Mozambique last year and continue that missions vision that our churches already have to send missionaries around the world to Portuguese-speaking countries, and we have our hand in some of those mission ventures from Brazil. Uh, so there's, there's also a, a Bible training center program that I help oversee where churches are training leaders within their own churches. Um, kind of a pre-step before they go to Bible college, an ability to, to solidify leadership within the church, to teach and to train, to give personal experience in ministry. And so there's a lot of neat aspects of our ministry that God's opened up. And so we're thankful for what God's doing in Brazil. Our, our heart is in Brazil. Uh, we even have a Brazilian. Our family's here this morning, all of us. Levi was born in Brazil, so he's a little Brazilian uh, as well. The boys are looking forward to going back to Brazil. They speak Portuguese and uh, they, they love uh, spending time with their friends there. So we're thankful for that heart that God has given us, the opportunity to, to partner with you all. I'll say a lot more about that this evening where I'll have uh, free reign to just share specific details, uh, a video uh, update, um, talk about a few more details and give you an opportunity for questions uh, if you all come back this evening. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about this morning in the message, uh, but we're going to focus this morning on, uh, I just want to share my heart with regard to our ministry and really uh, what we see um, in relation to you all as a supporting church um, and as partners in our ministry. As we were getting ready to come back to the United States last year, 
uh, I thought a lot about the reality of being separated from the people that you minister to. Uh, it's an interesting life that missionaries have. Uh, we're not able to be in the same churches all the time. Uh, we have partner churches, churches that support us financially that we're with every few years. In your case, it's been nine years. Lord willing, it won't be nine years the next time we're here with you all. But there's not a long time that we have to, to spend with you all. And, and the reality of separation uh, is something that, that is, is not always easy to do, even more so after two years of living in the city of Pashazadis, ministering to the same people, it was very difficult to say goodbye to them. Uh, even knowing that we'll be back in a year, and it's amazing, this year has passed by so quickly, uh, we'll be back in Kajazadis with them. Uh, it's difficult to say goodbye. The, the reality of separation is something that is human. Um, separation is part of life. Maybe you've lived in the same place your entire life and you haven't moved to other places and you haven't had to say goodbye nearly as much as other people. But the reality is that we all do are separated from the people that we love. We are unable to always be with them. Even more so this year, we've all experienced that with, with COVID, the inability to be with loved ones for, for fear of passing on an infection, the inability to have church services. I'm not sure how long you all weren't able to have church services, but each of us went through that experience where we weren't able to fellowship with believers. We weren't able to have that connection, that, that separation was something that we felt personally. Um, and it made me think a lot about Paul's heart for his churches. You know, Paul was not able to be with the churches that he planted for a very long period of time. Many times he would plant a church for a certain amount of time, and then he would move on to another place, and he may visit from time to time, or maybe he never did go back. But he carried the people that he impacted in his heart. He prayed for them. He cared for them. He even wrote letters to them. And Paul really shares his heart particularly in the letters that he wrote to his churches. This morning, I want to take a look at the book of Philippians, chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Uh, we're going to share Paul's heart and really my heart as well um, for you all and for our ministry in Brazil. This is some of the things that I shared with our church in Brazil, and I think it's appropriate um, to share with you all as well. The book of Philippians is perhaps uh, Paul's most personal letter. Um, other than the books that he wrote to personally to Timothy and Titus, uh, a book where Paul writes to a church, but he writes to a church that has experienced many of the same things that he's experienced, that has felt the same way that he has felt, that has suffered in many of the same ways that Paul has suffered. And, and Paul writes really opening his heart, really uh, with a heart that is knit to them, a heart that is on the same page as them. We know that Paul wrote this letter while he was in jail. You read verse 13, you see that, of chapter 1, you see that Paul is in jail. He is separated physically from the Philippians. He's not able to be with them. His desire is to go and to see them, to embrace them, to talk to them, to, to interact with him. But he's unable to do that. So he writes this letter from prison, thanking them for their support and their care for him. It's interesting, if you read the book of Philippians, when you get to chapter 4, you realize that Paul is actually writing this letter as a letter of thanksgiving because of a gift that the Philippians had sent to him. He was in jail, and when I think of jail, I think of not a nice place, right? Even today, jail is not a nice place, right? It's a lot better than it was back in Paul's day. When I think of the jail that Paul was in, I think of this dank dungeon, you know, that's just rats and water and dark and nasty place. I'm not exactly sure what it was like. Definitely not a nice place to be. His necessities were not taken care of, and so others had to care for his needs, provide his food, provide any necessities that he would need. And the Philippians, being a church that he had planted, being a church that cared for him, sent a gift to him seeking to meet those needs. And so Paul writes this letter back to them, thanking them for the gift, saying famously in chapter 4, I am thankful for the gift. It wasn't something that I needed because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, realizing that Christ was ultimately the one that strengthened him and, and gave him his necessities. He was thankful for the gift. He was thankful for their partnership with him. So if you will, the book of Philippians is almost like a missionary's heart for a supporting church or maybe even for a sending church like the church in Antioch that Paul was sent by. Paul writes this, this book obviously with an idea of thanksgiving, but also with the reality of challenging the church to continue to be faithful. There are numerous themes in this book. 
Paul talks about the reality of joy in suffering, something that he had experienced even in the city of Philippi. If you think back to the history of the church at Philippi, if you read in Acts chapter 16, you know that Paul was in jail in Philippi. He was beaten unjustly. He should have been frustrated and angry because of that situation, but instead at midnight, he and Silas are found singing praise to God in jail. And so you see Paul had already experienced joy and he had already demonstrated that. And he was, he challenges multiple times the Philippians to be joyful. He encourages them to, to perseverance. He encourages them to be unified. He encourages them to continue to sacrifice and suffer for the cause of Christ. And, and ultimately he challenges them with the reality, the precious knowledge of Jesus Christ, the reality of knowing Jesus Christ, of being conformed to his image, of being like Jesus Christ. And so Paul puts all these things together, and ultimately he's challenging the Philippians to be spiritually mature, to value their salvation, to value the grace of God in their lives as the highest thing in their life, to live out a life that is glorifying to God, and ultimately to strive on to Christian maturity. And so let's read the first five verses of chapter one this morning and see what Paul has to say to us and to the Philippians uh, in this passage. Philippians chapter one, verses one through five. Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Let's stop right here as we get to verse five. Paul has some introductory thoughts and we'll, we'll get to those in a minute, but Paul writes thanking the Philippians, recognizing the connection that they have, and really, he says, the reason why I'm writing to you is because of, as he says here, your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Now, this idea of fellowship, the word that's used here, we like to use that word. Um, it's something really that we probably are in lack of right now because of COVID-19. We're not able to have the kind of fellowship that we would have, right? But often when we think of fellowship, um, it's really a theological word. It's really a church word, right? We, we don't seem to use this word outside of the church. Um, we think of a good Baptist thing, which is a potluck, right? You all like potlucks? We haven't had been able to do a potluck in a long time, right? Uh, I don't know if you all do that or have that custom here, but fellowships often revolve around food, at least to be a good Baptist, that's what is involved, right? Uh, we're Baptists in Brazil as well. We work with Baptist churches. And I kind of joke with the people back and forth that I say, you know, it's a universal thing in some ways. You know, we're biblical. Uh, we, we ground our doctrine in the word of God. We have certain practices and beliefs, um, but we also have certain practices that don't really make sense, but they go across uh, cultural boundaries. Like, for instance, the idea of sitting in the back row, right? Um, Baptists do that, right? We kind of make that as a joke. It's a real thing because in Brazil, people like to sit in the back too. So it's a Baptist thing even in Brazil. I don't know if they learned it from missionaries, um, but they like to do that. So, um, but another thing that we like to do is a fellowship that involves food. That is a Baptist thing as well. It's not a spiritual thing. Um, but in Brazil, we call our potlucks churrascos. Uh, churrasco is a Brazilian barbecue. And uh, Brazilians like to make fun of American cookouts because it involves hamburgers and hot dogs. And they say, eh, it's kind of puny. You know, It's not really puny for us. But for them, it's like, no, nah, it's not really that great. In Brazil, we have steak, right? So when we have a shuhasku, when we have a fellowship in our church, we normally do it every three months or so. We get together in someone's house, and we bring the beans, and we bring the rice, and we bring all the other uh, parts of the meal. Everybody does. And then somebody brings the steak. They bring the sausage. Sometimes they bring the chicken and we grill it over the fire, and we have really good food. The only way that I can describe it, it's kind of like eating a Thanksgiving meal, right? You eat the Thanksgiving meal, and you're so tired, you're, you know, you're wiped out, right? Same kind of thing when you have a shuhasku uh, in Brazil, when we have a fellowship together. We, we're worn out from the quality and the amount of the food that we eat. Now, that's an idea that we have of fellowship, but the reality is 
And if we think more deeply, the, the idea and the concept of fellowship is much deeper than the enjoyable times that we have together. The food that we eat, the potlucks that we have, the reason why we have our get-togethers and our fellowships as a church is really the underlying reason why we have fellowship. Really, this word fellowship has the idea of partnership, of connection, of mutual, mutual participation. The word carries the idea of a cooperation or a commitment around shared values. Fellowship is a, commit, a connection that produces a mutual participation. The reality is that you can get together and eat with anyone you would like to, right? You can enjoy conversation with anyone that you would like to, with your friends, with your family, with your coworkers. But something that we have as a church, what we call fellowship, revolves around the gospel of Jesus Christ, revolves around our identity as sons of God. And so Paul, when he says, I'm thankful for you all, I'm writing to you, I'm praying for you because of your fellowship in the gospel, he's really pointing to this idea that there is a connection, a spiritual connection, a partnership that he has with the Philippians that cannot be broken, even by distance, because of the same grace of Jesus Christ that he had experienced together with the Philippian believers. Three times Paul uses this word fellowship, that's translated fellowship, in the book of Philippians. Here in verse 5, he, of course, he talks about the fellowship in the gospel. If you will, he's highlighting the doctrinal aspect, the belief aspect. Here are fellow believers in Jesus Christ. They're believing in the gospel. They had experienced the same grace of God. And so he wants to highlight the fact that they believe the same thing. They're trusting in Jesus Christ, that they are connected because of the message that Paul preached to them that saved their souls, that made them a church, that bound them together um, at the time when Paul founded the church. And we see that in Acts chapter 16. The second time that he uses this word fellowship is in chapter 2, verse 1, where he talks about the fellowship of the Spirit. Here we see something that maybe is a little more mystic. I don't know if that's really a good word, but, but something a little more intangible, if you will. The reality is that Paul had a connection with the Philippian believers because of the Holy Spirit that was inside of them. We realize that a person who accepts Jesus Christ as their Savior has the Holy Spirit within him that lives inside of him, that guides him into all truth, that illumines his mind to understand the Scripture, that becomes his conscience to tell him what is honorable and glorious and right in the sight of God and gives him that strength and that ability to live out the Christian life. So the Holy Spirit is a tangible force inside of all believers, and it binds us together. It's interesting, when we moved to Brazil, we didn't speak the language. Of course, the language is Portuguese. And you know, if, I don't know if you've ever been to a foreign country where you didn't speak the language, or maybe you've walked into a grocery store where they didn't speak the, the, maybe they were all speaking Spanish or another language, and you just feel completely out of your element, right? You don't know what to say. You don't understand what's happening. You know, you kind of want to get out of there as soon as possible. But imagine living in a country, of course, we were called there and, and we were moving there to, to minister. God had called us there. But when you arrive, you don't speak the language. You depend very much on the people that do speak English. Um, after a month of being in Brazil, uh, most of our colleagues had to go back to the States, and so we were literally on our own. And so we were attending a church, but there were no Americans there. There was no one that spoke English in that church, and we literally showed up. Sometimes, I, I remember the first few months, we were afraid to go because we're like, we're not going to understand anything. I don't really want to go, you know? But we went in, we sat down, we listened to the message, we, we participated in the service, even though we didn't understand very much. Um, preachers in Brazil will normally preach at least an hour long. I won't preach for an hour this morning. Uh, I hope not anyways. We'll see. But normally it's an hour long message or longer. And so you're sitting there in the service and you're, you're lost. You know? um, but it was amazing, even though we didn't understand for a number of months, the reality that we were believers, that we were with Brazilians who were followers of Jesus Christ we still had that connection. And so we, we cobbled together a relationship. There's something about the Holy Spirit that binds together true believers. Maybe you've had a conversation with someone and you start talking about spiritual things or it comes up and you realize, oh, this person is a believer. There's something that the Holy Spirit does that binds us together that 
makes us desire to work together for the sake of the gospel, to be encouraged because of what the gospel has done in our lives. And so Paul's reminding the Philippians, we have a fellowship because of the Holy Spirit that is inside each and every one of us. The last time that Paul uses this word fellowship is in chapter 3, verse 10, where he talks about the fellowship of Christ's suffering. You're familiar with this passage as well. Paul says that his desire is to know Jesus Christ and to participate, to, to be part of Christ's suffering, to fellow, have the fellowship of Christ's suffering. If you thought the fellowship was an enjoyable time that we have together, if you thought that it was a moment of eating food together, right? This kind of blows that idea out of the water. This really focuses us on what the true idea of fellowship is. It's a willingness, a connection that we have with Jesus Christ. It's a willingness to take up our cross, to follow Christ, to suffer for the cause of Christ. You know, we see that more acutely now in this culture, right? Maybe a year ago, maybe we, we were maybe more comfortable in who we are as believers and the reality that there wasn't a persecution, that we didn't have to stand up for our faith. But more and more, we should realize the necessity, if we are followers of Jesus Christ, that we are participants not only in the grace and the benefits that he gives us, but also in his suffering. Paul was willing to suffer for the cause of Christ. He was willing to sacrifice everything for the cause of Christ. So he highlights that idea and encourages the Philippians to do that as well. What, what we get out from this idea that I want to highlight this morning is that the gospel produces cooperation among believers. If we here this morning are believers in Jesus Christ, if he has saved our souls, we should be willing to be unified, working together to share that gospel with the world. We're blessed this morning to be your partners in sharing the gospel in Brazil. And we're blessed that you all are here, hopefully with that same mentality, to reach your area of the world with the gospel. You know, these are challenging times, but the reality is that the world needs the gospel more and more every day. The gospel produces that cooperation. As we've been back in the States, We've been so encouraged by the churches that support us, by our friends to see that God is working in their hearts, that God is doing that work, that they are effectively reaching out here in the States. And we're excited to see that God is using us in Brazil as well. We share those things together. So the gospel produces cooperation among believers. I want to highlight three areas of that in this text this morning. The first idea is that we have the reason why we have this cooperation, we have this partnership in the gospel is because we have experienced the same grace of God in our lives. Look, if you will, in verse one, Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. Here as Paul begins to write this letter, he's writing it together with Timothy, and he's writing to people that he calls saints. Now, we realize he's writing to the church at Philippi, but it's interesting that he uses this word saint to identify the believers in Philippi. Now, I don't know what you feel like when you hear that word saint, right? That also is a church word, right? Uh, a word that maybe we, we don't like to use very comfortably. Maybe you use it as a joke sometimes, like, oh, man, she's a saint for putting up with him, you know? Or, oh, man he's a saint for putting up with all those kids, or I don't know, whatever the case may be. You know, we, we kind of use it as a joke, but, but the idea of saint is someone that is a good person, right? A holy person. That's literally what the word means. Um, someone, if most of us, if we're willing to admit, say, I'm not a saint. That's someone way above me. That's someone higher than me. That's someone that, that, that is living a life that I can't attain to. Most of us are, are honest about our own um, inabilities, right? Our, our own sinfulness, our, our own uh, ineptitude or, or inability to be a saint. And it's interesting living in a Roman Catholic culture like we do in Northeast Brazil. Uh, Northeast Brazil is, is the most Roman Catholic region of Brazil. It's staunchly Roman Catholic. Most of the states um, are 90% Roman Catholic still, though a lot of Brazil has changed and become more Protestant in its leanings. Uh, our region of Brazil is still known for idolatrous Roman Catholicism. Um, there's lots of images. There's lots of statues. Uh, we see saints everywhere we go, literally. 
And the practice is in Roman Catholicism to canonize and to elevate people called saints who have lived exceptional lives. Um, in the practice of the Roman Catholic Church, you have to have been responsible for at least two miracles. Uh, there's a whole process of canonization that, that has to go on for a person to be recognized as a saint. But the reality is that someone that is better than me, that lived a better life than me, that earned more favor with God, is someone whom I can pray to, and that will give me greater access to God. And so really the idea is a works salvation. Really the idea is a living an exemplary life based on my own merits and based on my dedication to God and to the moral law. That's really what most people think of. And, and if we're honest, we're kind of squeamish about that. We understand that a saint is a saint because of what they do. But Paul uses this word saint. Does he use it incorrectly? No, he does not. Because in the biblical context, the word saint is not based on what we do. It's not based on the actions of our lives. It's based on our position in Jesus Christ. Paul uses this word saint correctly when talking about the Philippians to highlight the reality that these believers are saints, not because of the life that they've lived, not because that they are morally good people, though hopefully they are, but because they have put their trust in Jesus Christ. Because positionally, they have confessed their sins. Positionally, Christ's righteousness has paid the penalty for their sins. And he no longer, God no longer sees their sinfulness, but he sees Christ's righteousness. And so he can correctly state, you all Philippians are saints because you have put your trust in Jesus Christ. You are no longer guilty of your sins. Jesus Christ has paid the penalty for your sins. As believers, we are saints because we are justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's an exciting truth. You know, in this day and age, I don't know how many people you talk to outside of church about spiritual things, but there are not very many people that have that solid understanding of their position in Jesus Christ. You know, that should be an exciting thing for us. We should glory in that. We should not take that for granted. I grew up in church. My dad was a pastor for 30 years. Um, I'm used to, to going to church on a regular basis. I, I, I was trained all the Bible verses from an early age. And so many times I find I take for granted my salvation. I was saved at a young age, and I need to continuously remind myself, you know what, God's grace is not to be taken for granted. He saved me. He changed my life. And, and yes, maybe I didn't live an amazingly sinful life before I was saved, but salvation is a precious gift. The reality to be called the sons of God, to be able to be legitimately called a saint is a very valuable thing. In Brazil, we work with mostly first-generation Christians. Most of their family are unbelievers. And I hear amazing testimonies of how God changed people's hearts, how people that grew up in a religious system or, or grew up rejecting Christ were transformed by the power of Jesus Christ. We should be exciting about our testimony. It may not be dramatic, but every salvation is dramatic because of what God's grace has done in their lives. And it's an exciting thing. And so the reality is that we have a partnership in the gospel if we have experienced God's saving grace in our lives. If you can call yourself a saint this morning, not because of what you've done, but because what Christ has done for you, then that's a valuable thing. That's, a, that's an exciting thing that we should not take for granted. Paul continues on. Not only are we experiencing the grace through salvation, we can be called saints like the Philippians. But Paul's desire as well was that the Philippians continue to grow in God's grace and experience God's grace in their lives. Look, as you will, in verse 2. After calling them saints in verse 1, he says, Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Obviously, when a person accepts Christ as their Savior, they experience God's grace, his unmerited favor in forgiveness of their sins, in being called sons of God and being justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. They experience the reality of having peace with God, no longer being his enemy. But there is a transformation that happens. Salvation is not just a one-time moment that doesn't change your life. It should and does radically transform who you are as a person. Maybe not right away. <laughs> it's not a miracle where, where suddenly a lightning bolt hits and everything is completely different. But in some ways, everything is. 
If you're trusting in Jesus Christ, his grace should be something that slowly permeates your life and changes who you are as a person. Paul's desire for the Philippians was that they would experience God's grace and that they would live out God's grace in their lives, that they would experience God's peace and his calm in their lives, and he would continue, they would continue to demonstrate that in our lives. You know, think about the world in which we live, you know, to be completely direct, right, and for allow you to apply this to your lives at this moment. Don't we live in a world that lacks grace and peace? Is that not true, right? We're on the eve of an election, right? There's, there's no more contentious time in any country, and I say that having gone through an election cycle in Brazil in 2019 that was very contentious, um, so contentious that the, the now president was actually stabbed in the chest during the election campaign. Amazing, right? So at least we don't have that going for us in the United States, but elections are contentious, right? Our culture is contentious. Everyone likes to be right, right? We like to beat down our enemies, the people we disagree with. We, we don't demonstrate graciousness as a culture, right? Isn't this a time for us as believers to stand up and demonstrate God's grace towards others, right? Grace is not deserved, but it's shown, right? If God has demonstrated grace to us, we should be demonstrating grace to others. Understanding people, finding out where they're at, understanding what their true needs are, pointing them to the same grace that we've experienced in our lives. You know, the only way we can do that is through building relationships with others, interacting with them, investing the time, not closing ourselves off from the world completely, but allowing ourselves to interact with people. It's, it's been really neat in our ministry in Brazil to live in a culture where, where we're, we're the believers. There are very few believers, and we have to interact with people. We have to go and talk to them. We have to interact with them. There are numerous people that I interact with that I, I share the gospel with. I'll spend hours in their house. They're unbelievers. And we talk about their struggles. We talk about their alcoholism. We talk about the challenges that they face. And it, 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 they're not convinced initially, but you have to build that relationship. I'll share this evening about a lady, Keliani, has spent well over a year doing Bible studies, interacting with her through the church, sharing the gospel with her before she accepted Christ. And it was a long slow process of relational interaction with people, demonstrating God's grace, not condemning her for not being a believer, not, not distancing myself from her, but interacting with her, sharing her God's love and God's grace. You know, our world needs that. People are crying out for that in this world around us. We have to be creative in how we share God's grace because we are different. We are lights in a dark world. The other aspect is the idea of peace. You know, the more you talk to people, the more you realize the turmoil that they face in their hearts, right? In fact, we're probably going through turmoil ourselves as well, right? There's a lot of apprehension. As much as we don't like to admit it, we do hang our thoughts on election cycles, on general trends, on the news around us, right, of things that are happening, and we get worried and we get concerned. Where is our country headed? What is happening to our churches, right? What is going to happen to our children? What is going to happen to our job? There are lots of cares and there are lots of concerns. There are lots of reasons to not have peace in our life, right? Paul says God's grace and his peace are available. His desire was that the Philippians would experience that as well. You know, if we can boil it down and realize that we can have peace and trust that God, he is sovereignly in control of every situation. He is in control of our lives we can trust him to be in control of every circumstance, even though the world may be falling down around us. It's, it's amazing to be able to share God's peace with others, to have that internal peace because we're trusting in the God that is in control of us. You know, there are a lot of reasons to be concerned in Brazil. We live in a dangerous country. I don't know if you, how much you've heard about Brazil, but it is a dangerous country. I was astounded in the first six months as we were living in Brazil, I was starting to understand a little bit more. I was in a service and a, and a pastor preached, and he actually asked people to raise their hand. He said, how many of you have been assaulted, robbed in the street? And everyone in the church raised their hand, including teenagers. And I was like, what in the world? I, I could not believe it, right? I mean, I guess I could do a show of hands. How many of you have ever been robbed? And probably very few of you, if, if any of you would say that. That's a reality in Brazil. People live in fear. We live behind a wall with an electric fence, and that's not just our house, that's everybody's house. 
That's the reality of where we live. It's a dangerous place. We know people that have been killed. We had a teenager that is actually in jail now because of some, some legal issues, whether he did it or not. He was accused of a murder. Lots of things. They're, they're, it's a dangerous place to live. There are lots of reasons to be concerned. It's a scary financial situation for many people in Brazil. There, there are lots of concerns. People are afraid of death. We were able to share with a lady, uh, Sarah was, we, we had a very good friend, a pastor's wife who died in a car accident. And it, it was a devastating thing for us. Uh, it's been two years ago in October that she passed away. Um, but she was a believer and we had peace that she was with Christ, even though we were devastated at the loss. And Sarah was mentioning it to a, a lady while the boys were playing soccer. She said, you know, my good friend Martha passed away. And she said, but I know I have peace that I'll see her again because She's in heaven. And the lady said, she said, you know, I'm a Catholic and I've never had that peace. She said, I, I, wouldn't, I don't know how I could cope with my life if my best friend died um, because I don't have that peace that I would see her again. I, I don't have that peace that I'll be with God um, when I die. That's the kind of peace that we have. You know, we should allow that to radiate. That's something that should bind us together as a church. We can co- be trusting in God the grace that we've experienced, the peace that we've experienced in our lives, that should bind us together. So we have a partnership in the gospel because we have a shared experience in God's grace and in God's peace. He saved us. He's working in our lives. That's what binds us together as a church. That's what should bind us together as a church. It should be a place of encouragement, knowing that God is working in our hearts. It should be stimulating us to continue to be faithful to God's work in our lives. And so that's the first reason. We have a a fellowship or a cooperation or a partnership in the gospel because of a shared experience in God's grace. The second thing, very briefly, I just want to touch on this, but I think it's important that we have a cooperation, a partnership in the gospel because of the history of what God has done in our relationship. This is maybe a minor point, but I think it's important to note in verse 3, Paul writing says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Verse five, he says, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. I think it's important when you read this text to realize, and and anytime you read um, an epistle, that there is a writer that is writing to specific individuals. Maybe sometimes we lose that because it's written to a church or a group of people. But Paul, when he's writing to the Philippians, is not just writing to a church building or a group of people that he doesn't know. He may not know all of them, but he's writing to specific individuals within that church. You know, if you go back and you look at Acts chapter 16, you remember the story of the church at Philippi and the founding of that church. Paul came to the city, right, obviously to preach the gospel. He arrived at the riverbank and he met Lydia and a group of God-fearing people, right? They, but they didn't know Jesus Christ. So he shared with them the gospel. They were baptized, Lydia and her family and those with her, and thus began the church in the city of Philippi. Then, of course, he's in the city. He's preaching publicly. There's a demon-possessed girl that he heals who was a fortune teller. And because of that, he's unjustly beaten, thrown into jail. And that evening, at midnight, he's singing praises to God with Silas even though he should be discouraged. There's an earthquake, the bars are opened, and the Philippian jailer is saved. Though he's trying to commit suicide, Paul stops him, he comes in and he accepts Jesus Christ as a savior as well. And Paul, the next day, is kicked out of the city. So we know of at least three individuals, and and much more that are unnamed, that were part of that church in Philippi. Lydia, I believe that demon-possessed girl, and also the Philippian jailer and his family, all were part of that church in Philippi. And so Paul, when, he's, when he writes this letter, he says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. He's thinking of those personal times that he was with them. He's remembering the moment of conversion for these individuals. He's remembering the time that he spent with them, teaching them in the brief time that he had in Philippi. He's remembering the fact that they had communicated with him since the very beginning. He highlights that in the book of Philippi. And so Paul is writing to specific individuals. You know, it isn't just about the fact that we have a salvation testimony that God has graciously worked in our lives. The reality is there are lots of believers that we will never have an opportunity to know in this world, right? But God has privileged you this morning as part of this church, right? 
to know the people that are part of this church and to have a relationship with them as members of the local church, right? That's not in vain. There's a reason for that. God has a plan in that. He's brought us together as a church to work together, to encourage one another to grow in grace and to impact the world around us where we live. That's not to be taken for granted. God has brought us together as your missionaries to be supported by you all, to be prayed for, right? To interact with you all, to have a partnership. We have an impact in another place around the world, right? But we have a relationship. I'm, I'm very thankful to be able to be back here. It's been nine years, but it's good to see some of you that we haven't seen in a long time, right? It's good to realize that you all are being faithful, right? It's been very encouraging for us this year. Sometimes you feel like you're alone as a missionary. You're, you're struggling. You know, we never were at a situation where it was only our family, but almost when we were starting our church plant, right? We had a few Sundays where it was us, our family, and two other people. That happened a lot. And we were like, all right, what do we do? I guess we'll still hold service, right? That happens. You get discouraged. But it's been encouraging to come back and to see people being faithful in the pews. You may say, faithfulness <laughs> is not exciting, right? To just be in the same place over and over and over again, that's not exciting. You know what? God calls us to be faithful. It isn't stagnation. It isn't being the same because we change. We should be growing, right? But God has called us to be faithful, to be consistent to the responsibilities that he's called us to. It encourages my heart to see individuals continuing to be faithful for the cause of Christ. It was an encouraging thing to be Apostle Paul. He said, you know what? Not everyone has stuck with me. He was betrayed, right? He wasn't continuously supported by the individuals that he worked with, but the Philippians had continued to be faithful. He was thankful for that. He was thankful for the relationship that he had. I grew up in a church. My pastor was a pastor there for 49 years, and it's an encouragement to me to go back and see people that taught me when I was a kid continuing to be faithful, continuing to serve. Don't be discouraged by that. We have a relationship and it continues to grow the more time we spend together, the more time we demonstrate God's grace to one another. Unfortunately, we have a tendency to be together until we can't stand each other anymore and then we separate, right? That's not the way it should be within the Church of Christ. We should work together graciously loving one another, seeking to produce unity together, to be encouraged by the relationship that we have to see how God has grown. You know, it's an encouraging thing to look back and say, hey, I remember, remember those important steps that you took here in our church. Remember when you accepted Christ in that church and you're continuing to be faithful? Remembering when you got right with God and God's changed your life and he's been working in your life? Those are important milestones. Those are important ways that we can touch each other's lives and encourage one another. We have a cooperation because of that history that partnership of faithfulness working together. We're thankful to be able to do that as your missionaries and to continue to have that relationship from a distance, not always with you all, but being able to share that God's being faithful in us and we hope that he's being faithful with you all as well. The final thing, and this will be brief, we have a partnership in the gospel through our prayers for one another. Now this kind of enters into what could be an entire series of messages and sermons, but I just want to highlight verses four, five, and six as Paul begins a prayer for the Philippian believers. In verse four, he says, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. You now Paul's focus for the Philippians, he realized he couldn't be with them. He was in jail but he knew that he could pray for them. We see very clearly that he kept them in his heart. He meditated on them and who they were. He thought about them. He prayed for them continuously, right? He prayed for them, first of all, with a spirit of thanksgiving, right? Reminding them, look, God's done something in the past. He's been working in your hearts. It's not always a guarantee of what you've done in the past that you will continue on in the future but it can also be a stimulation for us to continue to be faithful into the future. He says, remember what God's done. I'm thankful for what God has done. I'm praying for you continuously. I'm thankful for the victories that you've had. His prayer was a prayer of optimism, right? He's saying, I'm confident 
that he who has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. His prayer was also a prayer for spiritual maturity. You know, there are a lot of things that Paul could have prayed for, for the Philippians, but he realized the most important thing was that they grow to spiritual maturity. You know, God doesn't need to resolve all of our problems. We need his grace for us to encounter the challenges of our lives in a way that would glorify him, right? God doesn't wave a magic wand and resolve our problems. He gives us strength to demonstrate his grace in the circumstances in which we're in. And that was Paul's prayer for the individuals. He prayed for them. He was optimistic. He was encouraged them. He challenged them to continue to grow in spiritual maturity. So our challenge this morning is this. We have a biblical partnership. We have a partnership because of the gospel. It's a unique and special bond. We as your missionaries are not always with you, but we're serving Christ in another place in Brazil, doing the same things that you all should be doing here, reaching out, sharing the gospel, demonstrating God's grace, growing in grace and in faithfulness and service towards one another. We're seeking to do things. We have a partnership. We're not always there together, but we have experienced God's same grace. We have experienced his hand in allowing us to be faithful up until this point. We can be praying for one another. I tell you very sincerely that you all pray for us and we're so thankful for your prayers, but we think about you all and we pray for you all as well. You all don't send us prayer letters, so we don't know nearly as much of what's going on here as you know what's going on in Brazil, right? But we do seek to pray for you. We do seek for you to be encouraged. We value our partnership. We desire that when we stand before the throne of God, that he will say we have been faithful, that we have partnered together for the sake of the gospel that we have done our part where he has placed us. And we're thankful for that. We hope that you're encouraged. I hope that you're motivated to continue to be faithful, right? You're thankful for the partnership we have. And as Paul said, he would finish his course. He would be gone, but his desire was the Philippians would continue on, that God would perform his work until the day of Jesus Christ. And we're thankful for that. Let's pray this morning. Our Father, we thank you for the partnership that we have in the gospel. Lord, we thank you for your grace that you've demonstrated in our lives. Lord, help us to value that grace, not take for granted the grace that we've experienced, not take for granted the relationships that we have, the gospel partnerships that we have. Lord, help us to use those as motivation to be faithful in this world, to demonstrate your grace and peace, to pray for one another, or to be encouraged and to know that you will perform your work in our hearts until the day of Jesus Christ as we rely on your Spirit to guide us. We thank you for this church. We pray that we would all be encouraged to live out in our lives the gospel and to glorify you in this day and in the rest of this week. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.